video tutorial we're going to have a look at the base of the skull or the base of the cranial cavity. So if we remove the skull cap and we're actually looking onto the floor of the cranial cavity, the cranial cavity being the space within which we would ordinarily find the brain and its associated meninges. When looking onto the floor of the uh, cranium we can see that there's some uh, interesting shapes in the bone and also a series of cavities or holes, some of which are known as foramina, others are canals and um, some are called fissures. So if we start most anteriorly in the skull, we can divide the skull into a, a series of three spaces or fossa. And the first one here is known as the anterior, because it's anterior, cranial fossa or space. Moving posteriorly, we come to the middle cranial fossa, which we can see is butterfly in shape. And then most posteriorly, we have the posterior cranial fossa. And within each of these fossae will be uh, different parts of the brain and other structures that are sitting or nestled within the, these particular cavities of the, uh, of the cranium. So let's look more closely at each of these fossae and consider some of the uh, key osteological features and bones that are forming them. So if we come to the anterior cranial fossa, this part of the um, fossa here is part of the frontal bone. The frontal bone is the, the big bone that's uh, responsible for our forehead and that at the bottom curves under to form what we call the orbital plates, which are essentially the roof of the orbits see them if we look um, up here would be the orbital plates of the um, frontal bone. In between the frontal bone we have um, another bone um, and we don't see the entirety of this bone we only see the top of it here and this is called the ethmoid bone. Now the ethmoid bone um, this bit of the ethmoid bone is known as the cribriform plate now the cribriform plate has a number of holes in it and we can't quite appreciate it on this model but there'd be lots of tiny tiny holes through this plate through which the olfactory nerve would pass. Another feature to draw your attention to is this here which is quite a, a bony uh, sharp prominence and it's known as the Christogali. Now this is um, important because it acts as an anterior attachment for a sheet of Jura, which folds down and runs in the midline, separating in part the two hemispheres um, of the brain. So there's a sheet of Jura that runs right the way down the midline and it attaches here. It's called the false cerebri, but you don't need to worry too much about what it's called at this stage. So Christogala acts as this anterior attachment for that fold of Jura. Now, if you have um, injury or a, a blow to the face, um, particularly in the region of the nose, that force can be transmitted um, up the way through the cribriform plate and Christogali. Um, and because the jura is attached, the, uh, the force could potentially uh, tear the jura, allowing blood um, cerebral spinous fluid as well to um, pass through the holes in the cribriform fossa or a fracture if it's fractured and that will then run into the nasal cavity. So any leakage of cerebral spinal fluid from a, an injury or a fracture to the cribriform plate or around there in the Christogala will lead to what is known as CSF rhinorrhea. And that's a, a sign that there's uh, been uh, some significant uh, injury to the anterior cranial fossa, particularly in, in this region. If we were to get a, a fracture through the orbital plates, um, then blood um, would be able to pass from um, within the uh, intracranial cavity um, into the tissues around the orbit. And that's when we get these periorbital ecchymoses. Um, we may see them on, on both sides. So periorbital ecchymoses um, or CSF rhinorrhea are all indications that perhaps uh, there has been a, a fracture involving um, the orbital plates and or um, the, the ethmoid plate here, um, allowing uh, leakage of, of CSF and blood from around the brain. 
the other bone that we see just posterior is the sphenoid bone. And the sphenoid bone, again, is, a, is an interestingly shaped bone. We don't necessarily appreciate it in its entirety when it's um, within uh, the skull in its totality. But what we see here is, is the lesser wing of the sphenoid, um, and therefore implying that there is also a greater wing, uh, which is actually what we would find um, just here. Again, we don't quite see it as distinctly on this model, but we certainly... Um, can sometimes see the, um, the, the greater wing of the sphenoid when looking laterally um, on the skull. So sphenoid, greater wings, lesser wings, and then a body in the middle. And interestingly, um, we have this feature here, this uh, particular shape to the uh, middle of the sphenoid, right in the middle of the middle cranial fossa. And this is known as the cella tersica. And cella tersica just means Turkish saddle. If I turn it slightly this way, you can perhaps appreciate that um, we have a, a dip in the middle here and a, a raised bit at the back and the front, which is a little bit like um, a, a saddle. And the bit in the middle here where I've put the pipe cleaner uh, is the deepest bit of the cella tersica, uh, which is called the hypophyseal fossa. And within that, uh, the pituitary gland would, would sit. So this here is known as the cella tersica, it's um, the central bit of the sphenoid bone. If we lift the skull up a little bit, and we've moved now from the anterior cranial fossa into the middle cranial fossa, so the cella tersica here is part of the middle cranial fossa. We can see from this angle the first of these two holes that um, we're going to consider. If I put pipe cleaner through here, um, this hole there is the optic canal. And if we turn the skull around, you can see um, the optic canal, which transmit the optic nerve, um, passes that nerve into the orbit, um, the orbital cavity and into the back of the eye. And obviously we have one on the other side as well, going to the right orbit, just here. Tilting the skull just a little bit more, you can see here there's a slit-like hole within the middle cranial fossa. So the superior orbital, because it goes into the orbit, fissure, because rather than it being a hole, it's more of a slit. And if we pass the pipe cleaner through here, we'll see that that also transmits um, structures into the, uh, into the orbit. So a number of cranial nerves will pass through this fissure, this slit, uh, to supply uh, muscles that move the eye and also some blood vessels that supply the eye. Okay. So... We then have a number of foramen um, as we move um, our way more posteriorly uh, around the cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa on each side. So the first we'll consider is um, this one here. And this is known as the foramen rotundum. So these next um, three, four foramina that we'll, we'll talk about um, can often, you can often relate their um, name to, to the shape of the hole. So this is quite a round hole, so we call it the foramen rotundum. There it is on the, uh, on the other side. And if we pass the, uh, the pipe cleaner through that hole, then it doesn't get very far um, because it passes into a very, very tiny space, um, which is actually quite difficult to see. You can just see the tip of the um, pipe cleaner there. And that space between the, uh, the sphenoid bone and the, and the maxilla, so this is the uh, the maxilla just, just here, um, is known as the pterygor palatine fossa. So it's a tiny, tiny space wedged between two bones and it um, has a number of um, nerves, vessels that are, are passing through before they uh, go on to supply the rest of the, the face. So that's the foramen rotundum. And that actually uh, transmits one of the branches of the trigeminal nerve um, being the, uh, the middle branch, the maxillary branch. If we come back from the foramen rotundum, we come to this um, shaped foramen, which is the foramen ovale, because it's oval shaped. And we have the other one on the side. And if we pass the um, pipe cleaner through the foramen ovale, it brings us into another space. Um, and this space, as we can see, is just below the temporal bone and medial to the mandib man mandible. You can see it better from this view. And that is actually the infratemporal fossa, the infratemporal fossa. 
Okay, so whatever passes through that foramen, the foraminal valve, will run into the infratemporal fossa. And we know that within the infratemporal fossa, we have some of our muscles of mastication, the pterygoid muscles. So the nerve that's passing through the foraminal valve is the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. If we come just lateral to the foraminal valley, we find the foramen spinosum. Just this tiny, tiny hole there. You can see it on uh, that side there as well. Okay, so it's just lateral to the foraminal valley. And a very important blood vessel runs through the foramen spinosum. <clears throat> if I can just try and uh, mirror that again with the pipe cleaner, the uh, blood vessel that's running up through the foramen spinosum is the middle meningeal artery. Now the middle meningeal artery gives two branches, an anterior and a posterior branch, and they will supply the, the dura, the um, membranous coverings of the brain. If we turn it around this way, we can see that there is a clear association between the pterion, which is the weakest bit of the side of the skull, and this underlying um, blood vessel uh, branch of the middle meningeal. So if there is a significant trauma to the side of the head which splits or fractures the bone then we may also injure the um, branch of the middle meningeal artery here and as that bleeds um, the blood will accumulate between the bone and the um, first layer of the uh, meningeal coverings of the brain the dura so the blood would essentially collect between the dura here and the bone uh, here and this is an extradural um, hemorrhage if we move now to um, this hole here, which looks a little bit lacerated. So it looks like a, a fissure in, in this view and that it's oblique, but actually we're just looking at this most medial end. And that is actually the foramen lacerum. And in life, actually nothing passes through the foramen lacerum. It's actually covered in cartilage. And all the foramen lacerum is, is actually it's the gap between essentially the, the petrous part of the temporal bone and the, the sphenoid. So there's just a gap between uh, those two bones where they didn't quite meet. So in life, that's actually filled um, with, I'll show you on that side, with, with cartilage and nothing goes through that. However, an important structure does pass over the top of it. And if we come back a little bit to what looks like this sort of a um, lateral bit of this oblique bit of, uh, of cavity, here we have the exit of the carotid canal. So this here is the petrous bone, petrous part of the uh, temporal bone. And what we have is a canal that runs right the way through the petrous part of the temporal bone, having arisen from the base of the skull. So if I show you this hole here, there is the entry or um, opening into what is the carotid canal. So if I bring this out, show you here, it's running... Um, exiting through the petrous part of the temporal bone, it actually runs over the foramen lacerum. And what will happen is actually the internal carotid um, runs into a structure either side of the cella tersica known as the cavernous sinus. The cavernous sinus is um, essentially a space created between uh, the two layers of the dura, and it's full of veins, um, some cranial nerves that pass through it, and also importantly, the internal carotid artery runs through it partly as well before it <coughs> goes on to join the circle of Willis and supply the, uh, <coughs> the structures of the brain. So that's the carotid canal. And the four foramen can be remembered helpfully by roles, R-O-L-S, in that that is rotundum, ovale, lacerum, and spinosum. So we now come to the posterior cranial fossa here. And again, there's a, a few um, bones that we need to consider, uh, sorry, holes that we need to consider. And obviously the biggest one here is the foramen magnum. The foramen magnum uh, transmits the uh, spinal cord. So um, the brainstem would continue through the foramen magnum as the, uh, as the spinal cord. So that's the foramen magnum. Coming on to, again, the petrous bone. So this bit of the temporal bone in part forms some of the middle 
cranial fossa, but also it forms some of the posterior cranial fossa. So the boundaries between the middle and the posterior are this, this sort of um, more superior ridge of the petrous bone. And on this aspect of the petrous bone, we can see there is a little hole, which I've just put the pipe cleaner in. And that is known as the internal auditory or acoustic meatus. Okay, so the internal auditory meatus. And housed within the petrous part of the temporal bone is the middle and the inner ear. So this structure is going to transmit the nerves that are carrying that sensory information of balance and hearing um, from, uh, to, to, to the brainstem. So the vestibular cochlear nerve is a nerve that passes through uh, this particular hole or opening. It also transmits the facial nerve, um, which has an interesting route through the petrous bone to subsequently exit um, through the base of the skull um, through a tiny hole just here, um, which is known as the stylomastoid foramen, um, called because it's between the um, mastoid process and the styloid process of the temporal bone. So that's the, uh, the styloid process there. And that little hole is where the facial nerve exits, and it would come round run into the substance of the protogland and give its five terminal branches. So that's the internal acoustic or um, auditory meatus just there. And if we move more posteriorly and inferiorly, we come to this um, very uh, large opening in the base of the skull. This is known as the jugular foramen. And the jugular foramen um, transmits the um, internal jugular vein. And that is actually a continuation of one of the veins that um, drains the, uh, the, the, the brain, one of the veins that drains the brain, um, and it's known as the, uh, the sigmoid sinus. So if I'm going to show you here, you can actually see um, grooving on the, um, on the bone, on this inner surface of the skull, where we'd have this sigmoid sinus uh, running down, passing through the jugular foramen, where it continues as the um, internal jugular vein. And you can see that the internal jugular vein, or where it exits, is in a very close proximity to the uh, carotid canal, or the opening of the carotid canal. So you can appreciate that these two structures will run down the neck very close together um, within that carotid sheath. Um, okay. So there's the carotid canal, and there we've got the internal jugular vein. Now, a few... Cranial nerves also pass through the jugular foramen with the internal jugular vein. Um, that's the glossopharyngeal, the vagus, and the um, accessory nerve will all pass through the jugular foramen um, with the internal jugular. The last uh, cavity uh, to consider within the posterior cranial fossa and, in, and indeed the base of the skull in its entirety is this canal here is difficult to spot unless we orientate it and look at the very edge of the foramen magnum. And you can see that there is um, a canal that runs through um, this bit of the occipital bone here, and that is known as the hypoglossal canal. And if we follow that through, the hypoglossal canal, which would transmit the hypoglossal nerve, will allow that nerve to run down into uh, or towards the um, tongue where it would supply uh, muscles of the of the tongue there okay so that would be the hypoglossal nerve okay and the hypoglossal canal just there okay so there are um, obviously quite a number of uh, features of the base of the skull a number of foramina fissures and uh, canals for you to consider and with repetition and repeated handling of the skulls and trying to test yourself, it will all eventually start to, to stick and, and make a little bit more sense.